forgiveness. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. Amen. Amen. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? All right. That's good. Oh, God, we thank you for your goodness. Be with us this morning. Amen. Bring somebody. Tell them you're glad to see them in God's house this morning. And we're going to praise his name.
whole earth, upon all flesh, to bring all flesh to glory in my presence. And revival is for things that are dead, but you are not dead. You are alive. Jesus is in your midst, and you are alive. But the things that need to be revived or that need to be dead are the old self.
back in this place, O oh Lord, our God, be glorified. Lord, may your name be hallowed in this place, in every heart, every mind. I don't think it was a mistake the way that you said the, when you said that in the Lord's prayer. I'm sorry, I'm not very articulate, but may we hallow your name. live in a way that honors you, that glorifies that name, that name above every name, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. You are the Lord of glory. Have your way, Lord God. Watching online, let them seem to make a big difference. Anyway, here at sunrise, uh, whether you're watching online or you're here in the audience, we believe that God is with us. And uh, in this crowd today, and whoever's watching at home, there's people that are going through extremely hard times. And there's people that have experienced great miracles, like instantaneous miracles. And a lot of times we we want God to do that instantaneous miracle right now like let's go up for prayer and let's get healed or let's go up for prayer and get delivered out of our trouble but recently the Lord's been speaking to my heart and saying when you go through the fire I'll be with you you're not going to be burned when you go through the water it's not going to overcome you, but you are going to go through the water. And I'll be honest with you, I've wrestled with the Lord over the last year about why do things keep happening the way they happen? And why don't I just get set free? Uh, rebuilding the house and the, I won't call them unbelievers, but they don't demonstrate a real dedication to the Lord. And every one of those builders or plumbers or whatever have said to me, Man, you seem stressed. And then I go home and the devil sits on my lap and he says, Good job, Dan. You're uh, supposed to be representing me. And you're stressed and that's what they notice about you. And I go, oh, this is just great. And so the devil never wakes up in the morning and goes, Oh, we put, we got enough on him. Let's let him go today. Uh, yeah, he's had enough struggles. Let's just let him be today. In fact, he gets up in the morning and goes, Yes! Yes, that guy got called stressful, and the guy got called this. And if I buy into the enemy's words, believe me, it doesn't take long for it to exacerbate. And I'm like, I got to get going, you know. I got to bust this out myself. But within the last week, the Lord's been speaking to me, and he said, Count it all joy when you receive various trials, for you know that the testing of your faith is producing perseverance. And perseverance is going to produce the image of Christ. And whether God takes us out of our trouble immediately or God leaves us in it for a while so that we learn to persevere, the goal is not so that we get healed or we feel better. The goal is so that we represent Him in every circumstance. The Bible says in this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart because I've overcome the world. And so here we are this morning in a church with some people that probably just want to get up and say, God healed me. Praise the Lamb. So happy. Our God is able to heal. But there's other people that can get up and say, I'm going through terrible trial. But I got the body of Christ. That's why we're here today. That's why if you're online, you're listening. Because God wants you to know that He is with you. Not 
not just in the good times, not just when things are going the way you want, but when things are really, really tough, and we find, you know what, I'm just going to lay my life before the Lord. I walked in here this morning, and I know there's a person in here that, uh, they get me, I'm teary about this stuff. There's a person in here that I know is going through incredible things, been through two surgeries, found out about cancer, blah, blah, blah. And the first words out of that person's mouth this morning was, I was in the doctor's office and the Lord spoke to me to give hope to somebody. And you guess what? The Lord can speak something to us when we're in our deepest place and we can go, I'm not giving hope to anybody, I'm hopeless. But instead they obeyed God. And when you obey the voice of God, I'm just going to tell you this, people around you are impacted. She spoke hope over somebody. When she gave that little testimony this morning, something left within me. And I said, I know that same God. And if God can do it in that circumstance, guess what? There's nothing too big for him. There's nothing too faithful. There's nothing too far for him to demonstrate his power. I'd love to promise you all your sickness is going away. I'd love to promise you all your problems because you came here or met online are going to be gone. But this much I can promise you, and it's not based on my promise, it's based on his promise. When you go through the water, I will be with you, won't be drawn. When you go through the fire, you won't be burned. But instead you'll come out the other side and know Christ. So Father, we bless you today. We thank you that you're a healing God. We thank you that you're a delivering God. We thank you that you're a God that sings over us according to your word. But Lord, we believe that you're also the God that says you will reign with me provided you suffer with me. I want to know the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. So we're not going to go through our suffering alone anymore. We're going to call on the Lord God who never changes. You're the same yesterday today and forever. And we believe that the image and the very presence of God is going to be demonstrated in places that we never asked or imagined according to the power that works in us. Greater are you that is in us than he that's in the world. So we bless and praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you. There's a little guest card in the back of your uh, thing there. It's also got prayer requests on it. Uh, put your prayer requests on. If you don't want everybody to pray about it, just put on their private or however that works. Uh, I'm not the guy that writes things down. I just tell someone I need prayer, so I don't use it very often. Sorry to say that. But if you're online, uh, we invite you to come here, not just so you can receive, but so that we can receive. Because you're part of the body of Christ, and we need you. Not because we're begging for more offerings or begging for this or that. But because the body of Christ marches together. And we'd love to spend time with you. And sorry to say if it sounds selfish, I'd like to glean from you what the Lord has in you for our body. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dan. I want to just take a second. I realize Buddy's still over here screaming for attention, and we're going to talk about him in just a second. But I want to just just tie in a few loose ends in here just to say, you know, I, I pray about what to say for giving. But ultimately, I just think this theme of the God who delivers and heals and the God who brings life and revival, there are so many people, not just in other countries, but here in our own city that don't know that God. There's so many people who go around and they think that, their best hope is to just be a good person and get enough karma that they can just live a good life and then die and become fertilizer for some plants one day. And yet we know that God who has created us loves us and came and paid the ultimate price of his life that we could have salvation, we could have victory, and all those amazing things. And yet, as I said, there's so many people around us who don't know that hope. Maybe you're even listening online. Maybe you're sitting in here and you're here because you, somebody invited you and you're like, I don't even know if I believe in this whole thing. But I just want to encourage you, if you're listening as well, that God is real and he will make himself known. God always does. But there are many people who don't. If you feel like giving so that we can continue to be a light here in Howell, Livingston County, and support missionaries, 
all around the state and the world so that people can hear what we talk about every week, week in and week out, about the good news. That's a, ma a major reason why we give to the Lord. That's just because we're being obedient, but because it makes a difference so people can have the same hope that we have. And so if you like to give, there's a few ways you can do that. There's offering envelopes and the seat backs in front of you, and you can give cash or check. We're not afraid of cash here, just so we're so good. I, I hear cash is king, but I like a credit card, but that's just me. But if you want to give by plastic or digitally, which is what I understand, you can text Sunrise to 833-345-5945 or on the website, the app, there's a donate tab, you can click that. As always, we're not trying to we're not trying to tell you to give because we need money, as you said, Pastor Nan, but it's just an invitation to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit because ultimately he rewards us for our faithfulness. And with that, can you welcome up Miss Erin as she talks about BGMC? No, I don't like the stage. Actually, Miss Caitlin, could you get my fancy cart? And while Miss Caitlin's doing that, I have this lovely Miss Caitlin. She has been an incredible help at Kids Church. We really love having her here. Um, with Miss Caitlin bringing that up, I would love to have all of my Sunrise kids come forward because we have a really fun activity to do. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You know I don't like to be here by myself. Come on, it's fun. What? Yeah, you can. That way everybody can see. Have a seat. All right, so we in Kids Church have been learning a new curriculum. It's, um, we spent last year going through the entire Bible, right? This year, we are digging into the heart of God and who he is, right? We've learned a little bit so far. We learned that God is creative, so we're creative. Do you remember that? Maybe? Some of you? Yes? Yes, I already yes. Okay. And then we learned that God is the greatest, Right? And we don't need to be. Remember they tried to build that big tower because they wanted to be greater than God? Yeah, remember that? Okay. So we are going to be moving on to now that God is giving, so we're giving. Pretty cool, right? God is very, very giving. And we're going to learn a story about somebody who got something from God that was so incredible that he blessed all of his grandchildren and his grandchildren and his grandchildren and those grandchildren. It's a really neat story. But first... What I would like you guys to do is stand up. I know you guys just sat down. Stand up. We do lots of exercises in Kids Church. I want you to turn around, and I want you to tell everybody in our audience today, Happy Grandparents Day. All right? Turn around. Tell them. <laughs> Thank you. Happy Grandparents Day to all of you guys. All right. Have a seat. Your grandparents... The greatest gift that you can give them is knowing that Jesus is inside of your heart, right? So we are so excited that you are part of Kids Church. Now, I have a tiny little penny here. And I keep hitting Buddy. I'm sorry, Buddy. So there's a little tiny penny. Is it very big? No? All right. We are learning that God is giving, and he fills us with lots and lots of good things in our lives. And even more than we can expect. So we are going to see how much water can go onto this penny. Do you guys have any guesses of how many drops of water can go onto this penny? Juliana, how much do you think? Or Arielle, I'm sorry, I called you your sister's name. How many drops do you think? Three? Okay, are you, you guys ready to help me count? You, you know how many? All right, well, help us count. We're going to see, all right? I get lots of water here. That was one. Oh, I'm shaking. Look at that. Two. How many are we at? Okay. Oh, we gotta get more water. I think that was four. Woo! Miss Aaron's dropping everywhere. There's six. There's eight, I think. Was that eight? I don't even know. How many are we at, Juliana? Or Josephine? Is it still going? Aaron, come here and see how many drops are on here. How many is that? Is that nine? Is it still going? Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot more than three, isn't it? Oh, my gosh. Oh, it just spilled over. How many was that? Sixteen? That is a lot, isn't it? What did you notice about the water on top of the penny, Aaron, before it spilled over? It made a big dome. You're right. So as the water reached the edge of the penny, the water molecules clung to each other and made a dome or a bubble shape on top of the penny. 
And each new water drop formed a hydrogen bond until it finally spilled over onto the side. Does that make sense? Lots of big words there. Lots of science. But what I want to know is what do you guys think? How are the water drops on the penny like the good thing that God gives us? How are those water drops like the good things that God gives us? I know I keep hitting buttons. Anybody? Are we frozen today in kids' church? He gives us more. Good job! You can come to kids' church! <laughs> Those good things pile up on our lives, and they get bigger, and they get bigger, and they get bigger, until all of a sudden, they spill over, and they impact all the people around us. So God is so giving to us in ways that we didn't expect. Like you have a roof over your head, and you guys have shoes on your feet, and you have food that I'm sure you ate really good breakfast this morning. Right? And we have church that we get to go to. All of those things that God gives us until our bubbles are so big that they burst and they can spill over to everybody in our lives. And that's how we get to impact the world is through our BGNC. Just those little spare coins that you guys pick up every single week, that gets to spill over from us and go to all these kids in different countries. Pretty neat, right? All right. So what I heard from all of you when I asked today about what competition I was trying guys I was trying so hard to get this church like really going Michigan versus Michigan State but these kids are like Pfft. so <laughs> because Michigan State would have won I'm sure Miss Kaylee <laughs> so we were told the green side because it's the cool side is going to be the dogs and the blue side is going to be cats all right so go ahead with your BGMC offerings drop Green side for dogs, blue side for cats. Go for it. Yeah, dogs are cool. We don't have very many feline friends. Uh-oh. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. I have the honor of walking with you through the book of James. It's about true faith. James is writing to a group of people who have lost their homes, they're being persecuted, and even where they're ending up, they're still running into all sorts of problems. He says, these trials that you're going through, this isn't a waste. This isn't even a coincidence. This is something God wants to use in your life. And so often we don't think about that. And so often in the Christian life, it's just billed as, oh, follow Jesus. He'll make everything wonderful. He'll take away all your pain. He'll make you rich. It, you know, it's like, no. What God wants to do is not just make you happy. He wants to make you holy. Have you ever thought of that as the goal of your life? When you're pursuing the things of God, when you're we're truly following the Spirit into action, it makes resisting temptation and, and bearing up under the, the difficulties and the trials so much easier. This is about having a deep, deep relationship with God. It's about knowing Him, and it's about, gosh, everything in my life revolves around Him. It's an amazing thought. And I gotta ask you, do you have that type of faith? Give me the wisdom I need to navigate through this life in a way that honors you.
Hey everybody, if you're interested in Family Camp, signups are going on right now. Come see me at The Hub. You can sign up. It's $65 for Friday and Saturday night. If you want to come early, it's another $32. Don't pay us. I'm just going to keep it. Go pay the site as you get there. Let us know if you're going to come out early so I can reserve it early for you. But yeah, if you're coming out on uh, September 15th, 16th, and 17th, we'd love to have you out for family camp. It's a lot of fun. We're going to be having the Euchre tournament again, so there might be a prize. There might not. But we'll, we'll see you guys out there. So come on out. Like I said, September 15th, 16th, and 17th. We'll see you guys later. Have you heard the expression, you can't walk and chew gum at the same time? I don't know if you can or not, but either way, I hope you can at least walk and pray. Because coming up on September 30th, from 10 to 12, we're going to be meeting downtown at First Presbyterian Church to take some time to walk around the community praying. So if you'd like to come out, you want to walk, you want to pray over the town, meet at First Presbyterian at 10 o'clock. It is going to go from 10 to noon, and we'll see you there at First Pres. I'm sorry to do this. But coming up in November, I know, can't believe we're talking about November already, but coming up, November 3rd and 4th is Youth Convention. You're watching for signups, they'll be coming out soon. I'm like, okay, no, there's something else. I get up there, boom, it's going to happen. So, okay. Got a real deep question for you to start with. Real deep question for you. How many of you think that God has a plan for life? Okay, that's a pretty safe question, isn't it? Because it could influence somebody else. How many of you have no problem with God having a plan for somebody else's life? You're good with that. Okay. They might even make a better person out of them, especially those really difficult people that, you know, they're out there, and you hope that God shapes them up, so you hope that that plan works. How many of us are quite as comfortable with the idea that God has a plan for our life? Cool. Some of you are going to say, yeah. How many of you, if we're going to be honest, how many of you really have to kind of think about that for a minute? Because there's always a chance, isn't there, that God's plan for your life might not be your plan for your life. Now, this is one of those really tough moments. I'm not trying to point it, there's a sinner! I'm not trying to do that. But how many of you have ever been in a moment where you kind of thought you might know what God's plan for at least the next step was? Okay? Maybe not the whole thing, but the next step. And you said, uh, no, I, I don't want to go there. I, I don't want to do that. Any, anybody, you've ever been there? Well, a couple of us. Everybody else is so deeply faith-oriented that you just automatically, without any question, you dive into whatever God's got for you because it is, it is awesome. Well, it is, but welcome to humanity. Humanity just works that way, right? We, we have our own expectations, our own desires. Now, I, I try to say this over and over. Most of the time, the desires that we have are not always black and white, super clear, right? I, I make the joke, do I go to Kroger and kill everybody tomorrow? Or do I go and save orphans? That's pretty easy, black and white. You, you, you get those easy. How many of you, you don't have those questions on a regular basis? Hopefully. Yeah, it's, you know, do I go to work tomorrow with a good attitude or a bad attitude, you know? I mean, what do I do? How do I interact with my friend, with my neighbor? You know, they're, they're very nuanced questions. And every once in a while, God steps in and goes, but this is what I want you to do. And we go, eh, I don't know. Now, we've been doing this series on the thought processes behind sin. I mean, I'm not dealing with individual things. I'm not trying to say, don't do this and don't do that and here's the list. Don't care. That's not my point. It's what the thinking process is behind it that starts playing in our head before we ever do the things we're not supposed to do, right? It's kind of the, the path. We were talking in Proverbs chapter 4 on Wednesday night where it literally says, don't even enter. Don't go into the path of evil or wickedness at all. Just don't go there. Don't start the journey. And that journey always starts here. It doesn't start with your hands and your feet and your money. It starts in your mind. So I want you to go and I want you to look at a, a passage. This is not my main passage, but it is kind of my introduction. And this is going to be in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. I'm going to actually have you flip there. Now this is what you call almost the first generic statement of God's will for humanity as a whole. Okay? 
It may not have anything to do with what you do tomorrow. And some of you are going to read this and go, oh, I've done that part. I'm, I'm finished. I don't have to go there anymore. That's cool. But this is the most generic first statement, if you will. Then God blessed them, male and female. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Some of you say, we already did that. We already did that. That role is finished. Okay, for me it is too. Okay. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So did God tell humanity, camp here and don't move? No, very much the opposite. God said, listen, now, what's the rules for that? I don't know. I, don't, I, really, I try very hard to never, never try to say anything that makes up what Scripture doesn't say. I don't want to go there, because that, that's kind of a dangerous place for a teacher to go. So why did God do that? I don't know. Maybe because God was an amazing craftsman, and he made the world a beautiful place. How many of you have ever been to the desert and found that that could be beautiful? You've been to the ocean coast and found that that could be beautiful. The mountains are amazing, the forest. And, and he, God says, I don't want you to just sit here. I want you to move around. I want you to live and go and see the places that I've made and the world that I've created for you. Maybe it's because when humanity gets together, we all start trusting each other and stop trusting him. And how well has that worked out through human history? Not well. And we're kind of in that place once again as a society where people want to depend on human institutions and human ideas and they're rapidly moving away from God. Maybe God said, go out and, and multiply so that you can have a relationship with me and see me more closely and not just see your neighbor and only see your neighbor and try, count on them instead. Okay. Generic sense. Plan. Now, I'm not trying to be rude or crude, but I think humanity's done just fine with the be fruitful and multiply part. When he says this, there are two. Now we're up to what, eight billion? I guess we figured that part out pretty well. But the, the multiply part was, was good, but the, the move around, the go into all the world, they struggled with that at the beginning. And then we had the society collapse, what I jokingly call the great flush, the flood of Noah, and we go back from a, a larger population to eight. And God tells them in chapter 9 of Genesis the very same thing. Be fruitful and multiply and go into the world. That's the beginning of chapter 9. But I want you to go to something that actually Aaron referred to today, and it often gets talked about. Let's go to Genesis 11. We're going to talk about the Tower of Babel. How many of you have ever been guilty of babbling? How many of you have noticed that I don't really care if you're older or younger, but as I'm getting older, I do tend to do more of it. Okay? Maybe that's not true of you. But maybe you agree with that. You know, you start, you're going to say something brilliant. How many of you have ever been there? You're, you're going to say something brilliant. You're in a conversation, and you have just got this amazing thought right here. And all of a sudden, you get a chance to talk, and what comes out wasn't so brilliant. And you're thinking, why was I so excited about that 30 seconds ago? <laughs> that didn't even make a lot of sense. Well, that goes back, if you will, to this particular passage. Let's go into verse 1 of Genesis 11. Let's see if she flipped right there real quick. There we go. And I'm going to be reading just so to let you know for flow through verse end of verse 9. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. Stop. Why? There was only a handful of people. We started with eight. Right? Eight adults. Now, I know, maybe, you know, maybe Shem, Ham, and Japheth all had mail order brides and they spoke some other language. I don't know. Probably not, though. Probably they are from the area, right? And, and everybody kind of speaks the same language. Now, there is no other language. Everything got flushed. You only have eight people. They all talk the same. So what are they going to teach their kids? Well, pretty much the same thing. Now, if you look at human history, as populations disperse, you start to get changes in morphology, changes in the structure of language, and suddenly people start speaking very differently. And over time that happens too. Anybody here ever try to read, not that I'd recommend this on a family-friendly basis, but anybody ever try to read any of Canterbury Tales? Okay, is it easy to read, Jeff? Why? It's body. That's why I said I don't recommend it for family-friendliness. But why is it hard to read? Okay. 
Okay, it's actually closer to 12th century, which is late 1100s. So you're good. It's very old. And there's roots there. You kind of struggle and you think, well, I can understand most of it. Most of us have, maybe if you've read any of the Canterbury Tales, you've read some of the kind of revised and modernized version thereof, you know, because the vocabulary is very different. The spelling is very different. So over time, or over dispersion, language changes. There wasn't much of that yet. So by the time we get to Genesis 11, how much be fruitful and multiply and spread throughout the world, how much of the plan of God was humanity doing? Well, not much. They were still close enough together, maybe because labor is hard to get and projects are scary and whatever. But think about it. They weren't afraid to disperse because there were bad guys out there. There's nobody out there but them. So it's really just a matter of sticking together. Next verse. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. Oh, we know there that they're a little bit mobile, right? They're all moving, but they're moving together. It, they, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Next verse. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. How many of you know so far, they're not doing anything that we know that's obviously wrong? They, they're sticking together a little bit much. They're not necessarily living out the clear statement of God to go into all the world and disperse, but... How many of you know God did not say, thou shalt not make bricks? There's no verse like that. God did not say, thou shalt not use mortar. And these are not the problems that they have, so they're just trying to deal with the struggles that they have with the stuff that they have. How many of you did that this morning? You woke up, and you said, I am tired and bleary-eyed, and I need coffee. And you did not, some of you are going, no, because you're brave and bold, and that's awesome, I'm, I, I like my coffee. So, so you, know, you, you did not go and pray for God to do a miracle. You went down and got what you had. You had your coffee. And you made it, and you drank it. Is that a sin? Nope. You're just doing what you have with what you have. No problem. Next verse. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let's just stop right there. Now, Aaron mentioned, and I'm not correcting Aaron. Aaron literally said this morning what most teachers say. They say, well, listen. What they wanted to do is they wanted to build a tower to show that they were equal to or better than God. God, you're in heaven, and we can get there. We'll build the Zigarette 2000. We're going to climb right up there. We're going to be with you. Other theologians say, well, they thought they could find access to God. That somehow they could get to heaven. And the, the, native, the, the nature of the conversation was, if we build big enough, we'll be there. Okay, now that makes this a question of what? What's the thought process? Let's build it to get to God. Let's build it to be better than God. What's the problem? Think about themselves. Thank you. What's the other one? No, good. Nobody should consider themselves better than God. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So, so we have a little bit of, of, it's a P word, pride, okay? And this is where the normal conversation happens, the normal teaching happens about Genesis 11. The first sin is pride, because what they're trying to do is either get to God without his help, show that they're better than God because they can get as high, as powerful as he is, okay? Like Lucifer, I will rise to the size of the north, I will get there. You know, fascinating comparison. And you know what? I can't say that that's wrong, but that's not the heart of the problem. Even if it's part of the problem, even if pride is an issue and a desire not to be dependent on God is an issue, that's not where the thought started. Notice that before they talk about the tower, they say, let's build ourselves a... Okay. If they're going to build a city, what are they planning to do with the city? Populate it. And yet, didn't God tell them to get on out and get into the world and do what he told them to do? It sounds to me like they're going to camp. All right? They're going to stay there. And they're going to make it permanent. Rather than having nomadic dwellings and move around, they're, they're going to plant their flag on the hill, say, this is where we live, this is where we die, this is how it is. And then they go on with the rest of the story after the semicolon. 
Let us make a name for ourselves, that's the pride side, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Oh, so the reason for the tower isn't because we think we're as big as God, or because somehow we think if we get up to the 18th story, we can find heaven. The issue is that we want to have a big flag that we can all see, that every man on earth, every woman on earth knows this is where we've staked our claim. We're not moving from here. God has given us his will, be fruitful and multiply and fill the whole earth. But we've decided we don't like God's will. We'll be fruitful and multiply, that's great. But we're going to do it right here. And so the first world mega project starts. And they start building their city and erecting their tower. So they can say, oh, that's where we live. That's where the center and heart of the universe is. That's what we want to do. Next verse, please. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. I love this verse. How many of you have read this verse and not really thought about it? God was not on vacation. God was not in the galactic, you know, Miami Strip or something. You know, they said, oh, what are these people doing? I had to make, make these human beings, they run around, they get underfoot. That's not God's reaction. God knows everything that's going on on the planet. He knows the hearts and minds of human beings. This is an amazing act of what I call fairness. God doesn't sit far away and just say, oh, you failed, eat, flush. Instead, he says, I'm going I'm to come to where you are. I'm going to see what the man on the street is seeing and thinking and feeling. I'm going to note the motivations that cause them to stake the flag on this plane and says, this is where we will stay. And we will not follow the plan of God. I'm not going to judge based on hearsay. I want to know what you say. Do you realize that anytime, anytime we begin to realize that God has a plan for us, and I'm going to be really careful here, I think that sometimes we don't really want to know. And I say that very carefully, because maybe you're not there right now. Maybe right now in your Christian life, you are desperately wanting to find the plan of God. And you are seeking it in the Word and in prayer and, and through mature believers. And you really want to find it. And if that's so, praise God. But I have been in places in my life where I didn't really want to know. Thank you. Anybody ever been there with me? I mean, there was a time period in my life, I mentioned it before, I was running from God. I, did, I knew that I needed to go to church because my parents would kick my butt if I didn't go. So I tried to find the absolute deadest church I could find so that I could walk in the door and say, check the box, I was there, I did the religious thing, leave me alone. But I didn't want God to have ever known the address of that church because they didn't really want to hear. And if I could be there, I think that maybe at least a few of us could have been there with me, right? You kind of maybe checked out of really pursuing God. You didn't really want to read the Bible that much. Oh, it's too hard to understand. Oh, I don't get it. You know, whatever it is. We, we don't really want to seek it because he might tell us. I'm seeing a few head nods there, right? We don't really want to admit that, especially in church. I mean, goodness gracious. But, but it's true, isn't it? If I, how many of you have ever done that with your spouse if you're married? You're walking out the door and he or she says something. And you didn't hear all of it, but you heard enough of it to realize you didn't want to hear all of it. <laughs> I love the looks and the smiles and the grins, and all, right? And you just keep walking because there's something called plausible deniability. I can't get in trouble if I said, well, I didn't hear you. You know, I, I didn't know that's what you wanted. And I went and I did my thing. And we're not talking about terrible things like, should I go have an affair? Obviously not. But I mean, it's just, I, I don't want to go to Bronner's one more time. I, I, I don't want to clean the house today. I, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to see the baseball game. I don't, whatever it is. And, and so we just kind of keep going. And folks, I think that that's exactly what human beings do. And so God is saying, you know what? I'm going to come down into the middle of this thing that you are building. And I'm going to thoroughly be able to know what it is that you want. Up close and personal. Because you see, I have a plan for you. And that plan is good. And that you are starting to back away from that good plan, which by definition is bad. <laughs> and, and, and I want to thoroughly know what's going on in your heart. Next verse. And the Lord said, Indeed the people are one, 
and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Oh, boy. Um, a long time ago, I, I am a nerd. I'm an uber nerd. I understand that. I'm one of those sci-fi lunatics. How many of you like any sci-fi shows or books or anything at all? Welcome to the Grand Council of Nerds along with me. That's how it works. Um, and, and I used to read this verse, and I used to think, maybe God was nervous that he created human beings and he put so much creative ability and intelligence in us that they're, what he was saying here was, they, they get out of the box. They could, who knows, they could invent teleportation or light speed or, you know, immortality or something amazing. That humanity was just this close to something extraordinary. And God was like, we, we can't have that. And so that everything that's going to happen next is God's way of saying, ah, uh, don't go there. Can't cross that line. That's not what his problem was. How many of you have ever watched a loved one start making decisions and you realize the end of that decision cannot be good? It will not be good. All the time. A spouse, a child, grandchild, a neighbor, somebody you care about, and you realize that won't be good. God is looking at humanity and looking at this, this, this desire to stake a claim and never move, to break his will. And he realizes not, ooh, they're going to develop, they're going to develop teleportation. Ah! He goes, they are going to destroy themselves. I can't leave them there because disaster will be the result of their choice. The reason I know that that is the center, I don't have to get super into the language here, is because all of us have been there with somebody, haven't we? That hanging out with those people is not going to do Junior any good. Picking up that habit is not going to help my wife, my father, my whoever. That is not going to go well. And a loving God is looking at his creation, the ones that came out of the great flood. And he says, uh-uh. I've got to stop that mess before I have to flush it again. It doesn't say that, Pastor. I know. I'm not saying it does. But how many of you understand God didn't like to flood the world the first time? It wasn't, all, it wasn't like God woke up one morning and said, oh, these people take me off. Aren't you glad that God's not like us? How many of you have ever seen a lunatic trying to pass on the right? <laughs> now, if you are a passer on the right or you have joined my official lunatic fringe group, I don't care how big of a hurry you're in. I don't care how big of an idiot they are in front of you. Stop. It ain't legal. Okay? Now, I have to admit, pastor has to admit, that when I see somebody zipping up the right side, especially on the freeway when you're old and waiting for a long time, I just want to pull right into the, the, you know, the edge. And I've done it before. You know, okay? And you just slide over. And now they can't go around you unless they go in the ditch. And they're not usually that desperate. So you kind of stop. And it's funny to watch people laugh. And they're honking. And you're like, uh-uh, I'm going to do it. This is how I see God doing it. It's not that he wants to run you off the road. Because I've been tempted. I'm not God. God's a lot nicer than me. You are really glad that I'm not God. I would tempted to run him off the road. But I don't. Kind of get in the way and see what they'll do. And that's, I think, what's going on here. Next verse. Come, let us. I love the plural. This is the Trinity. This is the personalities that are part of the Godhead speaking to each other, taking counsel. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they might not understand one another's speech. Have you ever been in a place where you don't speak the lingo? What do you do? Talk louder. <laughs> I love it! You talk louder! <laughs> or it's, like, it's like talking to somebody that's Spanish or Italian, you start tacking O's on everything, like that's going to help. It's not going to help, you know? I mean, I, yeah, we talk louder, we, you know, we, we, we start doing charades, you know, maybe if I act it out, they'll know. My, my point is, isn't it amazing how 
often God puts you in a situation where you notice that people can figure a lot of things out even when they don't speak the same language. Some people, you'll be surprised, they speak languages you don't. I know I've told the story a lot of times. I'm in Poland, I'm waiting for a car. Don't know who's in the car, but I'm told I'm supposed to get in this car and go someplace with them. And they pull up and they start speaking Polish to me. And the only Polish I can say is near Zoom issues. I don't understand. There's some variant thereof. I'm probably not saying it right anymore. And he looks at me and he, he starts talking in German. He, no, don't speak German. Ruski! No, don't speak Russian. And he goes, okay, my English isn't very good, but I'll try that. Just that smooth. I'm like, you're better than me. We're good. Where are we going? You know? It's, like, it's amazing how people can figure things out. Even if you don't have somebody that can literally interpret, you can usually figure things out. So would it have been po possible for humanity to go, oh my goodness, we got like 93 different ways to talk. Let's figure it out. I suppose. But do they? Next verse. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Why? Because God picked them up and threw them? That would have been funny. Ah, flying people. Yeah. No, that's not how it operates, right? So God scatters their language. How does he do that? I don't know. I have no idea how God does that. He goes and he flips a few switches in the brains, and suddenly you're speaking Uzbeki. I have no idea how that works. And he does that, and everybody's going, I don't know what they say, and I don't know what they say. I'm going to stick with the people that I can understand. Because those folks are crazy. Have you ever noticed how quickly humans sort themselves out into groups based on looks and money and language and general social ideas? We just kind of, you go in a room and watch people sort themselves out. It happens. And that's what happens in this first city. All of a sudden, by just, God doesn't have to kill anybody. God doesn't have to make anybody sick with a plague. All he has to do is, mess up their language, and they'll self-sort, and they'll start not trusting the people who don't talk like them, and they'll start moving out into the world and following the plan that God has. Verse 9, therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. God has a plan for you. And I admit, there are a lot of plans that God has for us that we don't really understand. But God, I like this city. I like this tower. I like this culture. And you would not believe the rugby games that happen in this town. Why do you want me to move over there? Why do you want me to do that? Why do you want me to go in the grocery store and talk to that person? Why do you want me to quit my job and change it right now? Why do you want me... I, imagine, was it um, Hosea? Mary Gomer. What? If you don't know what I'm saying, go read that book. You know, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, excuse me? God has a plan for our life, and he knows what he is trying to do. And, and really, when we run into the plan of God, we always have to ask the same question. What am I going to do with it? Do I trust him and obey? Despite the fact that I don't know where this road is going, despite the fact that this isn't the road that I think I want to be on, if I know, if I've actually listened, if I've read the word, if I've talked to mature believers, and I'm starting to get the idea that this is God's plan, am I going to follow it? And every human being all the way back before this has had to make that decision. Now this story is kind of cool because you get this miraculous burst of different languages, and usually I've never known God, well... If you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you can develop another language. We can talk about that another day. But you still speak your own, so that's cool. How many of you might change the direction of your life if you suddenly woke up tomorrow and you could no longer speak or understand English? Maybe. I don't think that's going to happen. I think you're safe there. But the next time God taps on your shoulder, what are you going to do with it? Because part of the start of sin is to say, I'm going to follow my plan. Thank you. I'm going to do my thing. Thank you very much. And again, it doesn't have to be so clear as kill people, help orphans. I'm just going to do what I want to do. Because it's what I want to do. It's my goal. It's my want. It meets my need. That's why I think a lot of times we don't want to listen to God's very clear plan. Because we're a little afraid 
they might tell us to do what we don't want to do. Can I tell you that even when he does, he can make all the difference in the world? I'm not one of these people who believes that God always wants you to do what you don't want to do. I don't really think that's true. I don't think God is a cosmic joy killer. Not at all. He's the creator of joy. He wants you to have joy in your life. I totally believe that. It's just that his plans are better and deeper than any plans you can possibly make. And if it does conflict with what you want, and you obediently decide to walk where he asked you to walk, you'll find out it was a lot better. A lot better than where you thought you were going to go. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we could talk about the details of sin all day. Something that people do, a pastor doesn't think, or that the Bible says no to. And, and I don't know, there's a place for some of that somewhere, but that's not our business this morning. Instead, our business is to try to lay bare, reveal, some of the thought processes that go through our head. And we don't think about it at the time. We don't usually think, oh, there's the beginning of sin. We think that we're logically considering the situation, we're, we're exerting our freedom, we're doing what we want to do, and we think, oh, that's okay. And the problem is, is those thoughts become lodged in our minds, and we think them through, and we begin to justify our choices based on those thought patterns. We just, that's how we do it. It says desire gives birth to action. Action is sin, right? We don't have a problem. We walk there. That's where we begin to lose. So, Lord, I believe that you have a plan for every single man, woman, and child in this building. I believe that you have a plan. Now, there are elements of that plan that are the same for all of us, just like this basic thing. Go out into the world, multiply, you know, and, and go and fill it. You want us to act out your character. There's not one person in this room that you say, oh, forget my character, you do what you want. He wants all of us to be loving and compassionate and holy and just. And, and he wants us to do that because that is who he is. But Lord, often we begin to say, this is where you need to live. This is what you need to do. And that's never my call. It's not my job to speak that into somebody's life. But they begin to hear from you if they're trying to listen. You begin to tell them what the next step is. And Lord Jesus, because I've been there, because I struggle with it as much as any other human being in this room, there are times I don't want to hear you at all. There are times I have to admit I, I really want to follow mine. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, that you'd help us. Give us that realization at that moment. When I'm there, when they're there, but they remember back to this story, even if they forget everything else they, that I've said. And they remember the day that humanity said, I'm staking my flag here and I refuse to do God's plan. How well did that work? Whether you let us make our own steps and then watch the self-destruction that comes, or whether you find a way to divert us into the path that is good, I ask you that we would be people who would stop listening to ourselves and our own will only. say, you know, I, I need a little extra help with that. Pastor's not going to put you on a list. Don't worry. There's no cameras looking at you. going to identify you. Just say, hand up, hand back down. I, I struggle with that sometimes. I'm there. I'm in the boat. Okay, a few of us. God, for them, and maybe for a few people who, you know, do the will of your good and true. God, I ask you that you would make us sensitive. And when we start thinking the wrong way, Tell us the end of the road, you remind us that you are the great road builder. That you are the one that knows what we need to do. And that if we follow you, the best will happen. We ask that in your precious name. And I'm going to open these altars. I mean, I could have hold you very long. If you got to leave, go ahead. We're going to open these altars because I think it'd be great. But it's easy for me to say these things. You go, oh, oh, that's cool. And you walk out and it's great. But how many of you know that there might be something in your life right now that you know you're dealing with right now, right? And it'd be very easy to kind of get out of the way and not pay attention to that because then I don't have to, you know, decide what I'm going to do right now. But finding a moment in your chair, finding a moment in this altar, laying that issue before God and saying, okay, I 
know that what I want to do is help me to walk in the way. That's a great application moment. So as the worship team leads us just a little bit, let's take a moment to do just that.
Lord Jesus said, we're really starting to look for you. And say, God, how does this life I'm living play out? How does it play out? What do you want from me? Say, Lord Jesus, we're putting ourselves in a place where you begin to speak to us, lead me, heal me. And wow, cool things can happen now. Yes, Lord Jesus, you messed up the first city. The first tower is just a name. It's been forgotten. And yet you've allowed humanity to live in some wonderful places, see some amazing things. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for bringing us to experiences we had no idea of when we thought we'd give our lives. We thank you and praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Echo that first command. I won't tell you to be fruitful and multiply it, so I must have done that. But I can say, go out there and live in the world that he gave you. Live with all the spirit and all the joy and all the energy that he's given you out there. Just see what he's got for you to do.